thank the organizers for having me here. I've been to uh, the Maritime Innovation Conferences over the past few years, and I'm always impressed with the array of uh, companies and, and the types of technology, and, and also the pace of the development. I mean, every time I come, there's something new and, and a new area that's uh, that's emerging. So it's it's really exciting just to see this and and play a small part in, uh, as as a speaker. Um, so. What I want to start with is a, a premise that part of what all of us do is try to predict the future. I mean, we do this in our work, in, in the businesses that uh, are represented here. Uh, we do this in the academic realm, trying to anticipate what are the future needs for our students? Where are the career opportunities going to be? Uh, from a military standpoint, of course, you want to predict where are the threats? Where where do we need to be prepared? Uh, from an environmental standpoint, you want to try to understand what are the trends in our, uh, our ocean environments, our marine environments, and, and how do we monitor that, how do we understand that, and, and address those changes. So starting off with, what do we know about the future? We are a coastal society. Everybody here, I'm sure, uh, understands that. And if we look at some of the uh, statistics in 2010, a NOAA study showed that 39% of our population lived in counties that were directly on our shoreline. And that population is expected to increase over the next five, 10, perhaps further. And the oceans play a, a role in many aspects of our daily lives. They, certainly influence our environment, they provide habitat for marine life, they uh, influence the composition of our atmosphere, they affect our weather, uh, they are an important part of the economy as all of us uh, here can certainly appreciate and, and, uh, and we depend on that for uh, the, the health of our coastal communities but even beyond that of our, our nation and, and even globally. Uh, they affect weather and climate, and so we can anticipate, uh, you know, that understanding the oceans and the processes, the physical processes, and, and uh, the, the exchange of heat and water uh, with uh, our atmosphere certainly is going to be a factor in, in how weather is, is forecast, but even understanding longer-term changes in climate. The oceans are a major source of food. They're uh, globally important as a source of protein. And so how do we sustain that? How do we manage that in a, in a responsible manner? And of course, national security. Uh, the oceans represent uh, an arena that uh, we play a major role in as, as uh, uh, nations. Um, and that it's important that we understand what are those uh, changes, what are the, the uh, social and political uh, factors that are going to be important in preserving uh, a, a high quality of life for our, for our uh, society. And then lastly, not least, recreation. Uh, we enjoy being close to the water. We enjoy uh, those days on the beach, uh, getting out on the water, uh, just looking at the water. I mean, again, most of the, our population, a large percentage of our population is, is on the coast. So looking more at the economic aspects, this was a study that was done by the Public Policy Center at UMass Dartmouth. And what it shows is that the maritime economy in Massachusetts is a significant part of the overall uh, uh, Commonwealth economy. So over 90,000 workers, 3.4 billion in total wages, 6.4 billion gross state product. Uh, and the growth in that sector exceeded the industry average, the industry total. So there's also in, in Massachusetts a higher concentration of, of mar maritime industries compared to the nation as a whole. And tourism and recreation, perhaps not surprisingly, represented the largest economic sector. Uh, but marine technology is also a significant factor in the innovation economy in Massachusetts. And there are expectations that this is gonna expand and continue to grow. And, and uh, two areas that were identified in this study were our aquaculture and marine renewable energy as emerging opportunities where technology is gonna play a major role. 
And we also know that our oceans are changing. Sea level is rising, actually rising at a rate faster than uh, some of uh, projections, some of the projections that have been made. Um, we know that the <coughs> oceans are warming, and this has consequences for the heat budget, uh, the global heat budget, has consequences for climate. We know that the chemistry of the oceans is changing as we continue to see carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere increase. Uh, we're seeing increasing uh, levels of ocean acidification, which has consequences for marine life and for uh, enterprises that uh, depend on uh, the, the uh, uh, harvesting of, of marine life, such as uh, aquaculture and shellfish uh, industries. And ice cover is changing. Uh, the theme of uh, our previous uh, conference here was the Arctic, and of course, uh, as the ice cover is reduced in that area, that's also changing the dynamics there, changing the, the political considerations, the strategic aspects of that. And we're seeing changes in the distribution of marine life as well. Uh, this is just one example of the uh, lobster. Uh, you can, this goes from 1967 to 2014, and you see in 2014, it, the distribution starts with lobster well to the south, well in the, in the mid-Atlantic Bight and in our region here. Uh, but then as we progress up into the uh, more recent years, the concentration has moved well far up into the, the Gulf of Maine. It's still a very profitable industry, it's a very productive industry, but it's had huge impacts as far as the distribution and, and where that uh, industry is thriving. And then of course, increased human population and coastal development. So all of these things are uh, changing, they're, they're dynamics that are ultimately going to require effort to manage, to understand, and to address these. So how do we address ocean change? Well, one of the things, of course, is that we need to be able to observe how the oceans are changing. Uh, and that's gonna require advanced technology, it's gonna require the development of, of some of the things, many of the things that we're talking about here, better battery capabilities, uh, autonomy, uh, platforms that have greater uh, longevity, resilience, and so on. Uh, and we need to understand what those observations mean. So it's not simply enough to gather the information, but we have to process that. We have to be able to put that into a modeling framework uh, that provides some diagnostics of why these changes are occurring. And then ultimately, uh, the goal would be to be able to predict forecast change so that we can anticipate, so that we can uh, be prepared, we can uh, manage uh, resources, we can also anticipate changes in our coastal uh, regions and, and prepare for that. And to do that, we have to be able to innovate. So uh, we're going to need new approaches, we're going to need new technologies, we're going to need strategies that we probably don't even know what they are yet, they don't necessarily exist yet, but a, a lot of the people in this room are gonna be the ones that are driving that innovation. So just uh, also to um, look at uh, another sort of aspect of ocean change. There are a couple of documents here I'm just gonna uh, refer to. One is the National Climate Assessment. It's a climate science uh, si special report, the fourth National Climate Assessment that was done by the uh, U.S. Global Change Research Program. And then another one by the National Academies, which talks about sustaining ocean observations to understand future changes in Earth's climate. And some of the points that came out of this were a critical need to sustain and enhance our capabilities for ocean observation. We need to have the capability to monitor essential climate and ocean variables. We need to be able to use that information to improve management and stewardship of ocean resources. And we also need to use that for coastal protection <laughs> and maritime safety. And those are just some of the examples. We need a combination of platforms we, we've heard uh, in many presentations yesterday about the concept of integration of different observational platforms. And so one example of that is both satellite and in situ technologies are gonna be needed. 
And of course, we've heard about an array of different types of in situ technologies here. And then some of the challenges that uh, we're also hearing about at this meeting are how we address battery technology, power distribution, maintaining these platforms in remote locations, uh, biofouling issues, how do we address that? Uh, in improving uh, telemetry, communications, and then autonomy and intelligent platforms. So uh, for the remainder of the talk, I'm just going to go through very quickly what UMass is doing in some of these areas and how it's focusing its effort on oceans and the blue economy. And then I want to do a little self-advertisement about our, our new facility, the School for Marine Science and Technology in the south end of New Bedford. We just opened our new building there. Uh, and then lastly, I want to finish up with sort of a, uh, an idea, uh, uh, something I'll throw out uh, for consideration is uh, what, what are our opportunities to really solidify a regional network of partnerships in marine innovation? And I think we have all the elements here uh, the work at the CIE and, and the work of, of Cove and others, uh, all of these things are, are really providing, I think, a, a very ripe uh, sort of environment for fostering this. So what is UMass Dartmouth's commitment to our ocean future? Just talking a little bit about, uh, about uh, our university uh, here uh, in this area in the south coast of Massachusetts. Uh, we've just completed the SMAS expansion. It's a $55 million project. Uh, combining this building with the existing building, we now have about 100,000 square, 100, square feet of a marine campus in the south end of New Bedford. It's the largest marine science program in the UMass system. And it's the lead campus for the UMass Intercampus Marine Science Graduate Program. Uh, and then we have the CIE, and we've heard from Toby what some of the uh, achievements are there, the companies that have uh, spun out of this uh, effort, and, and just the networking that we're seeing here today is an example of some of the great contributions of, of, of that. And UMass Dartmouth is expanding its, uh, its partnership, its network of partnerships. Now, this was an Ambitious, probably failed attempt at trying to get everybody on here, and, and uh, so I know I've left somebody off, and I apologize right up front. But I, I ran out of room, so I gave up. Sorry. But uh, anyway, the idea here really is that there are a lot of us uh, in this area and in in the surrounding areas uh, that really have a stake in this. I think in in innovation economy and a blue economy, and we understand the importance of that for the future. So what else? If we look at the main campus, there's a tremendous amount of resource there as well. We have various uh, units, uh, the College of Engineering, Charlton College of Business, our Public Policy Center, the Law School, all of which have some contribution or role in the marine area. Uh, the College of Engineering, acoustics, uh, signal processing, remote sensing, uh, low uh, frequency communications, underwater communications, and so on, a variety of different areas that they work in. Charlton College of Business, of course, uh, working with Toby on how do we market, how do we transition, how do we commercialize some of these new ideas, these new innovations. The Public Policy Center, you saw the, the study that they did uh, the, on the maritime economy, but also looking at things like how do we develop policies that promote responsible development in our coastal areas? And then the UMass Law School has a tremendous role to play in maritime law and fisheries law, a variety of other areas. And then th that's certainly not a complete list, but it, it gives you an idea. And then Toby already made reference to the fact that we're part of a UMass system. And so I, I, I haven't included the medical school here because that one uh, I think is sort of, it's set apart a little bit from from this, but certainly Amherst, Lowell, Boston, and Dartmouth all are very act, play active roles already in various aspects of marine uh, uh, research and education. So, the Blue Economy Initiative. What what is this? This this is an initiative that's really coming uh, with the new chancellor, with uh, Chancellor Robert Johnson, and he's really embraced this, as, as Toby made reference to in his remarks. This idea that the Massachusetts South Coast region 
really uh, has a critical role to play in maritime innovation and ocean solutions, and it, it can represent not just our South Coast region, but the Commonwealth, New England, and beyond. And that's really a central theme of his inaugural platform, and he'll be sort of rolling that out in April. Uh, but the idea is to bring together businesses, government, labor, academia, environmental organizations, and to really look at the potential that exists for innovation, entrepreneurial ventures, and so on. So with that, now I want to talk about our school, the School for Marine Science and Technology. And I've already mentioned it's the leading marine science program in the UMass system. The expansion uh, really is going to support growth of critical research, uh, in instructional, educational, administrative, and so on, in the marine area. So what this really is, is a recognition uh, by our university, and by the UMass system, by the Commonwealth, of the importance of marine science to this region and, and to the Commonwealth as a whole. And it's really going to house the uh, research and graduate education, not only for our current faculty, but uh, faculty that we anticipate will be coming to the program over the next 20 years uh, and, and expand to meet the needs of the South Coast region for ocean sciences, fisheries, and ocean technology as a whole. And this is kind of a, a, a cartoon representing uh, SMAS and, and some of the core principles of SMAS research, experiential learning and service, uh, and using that to generate knowledge that educates and informs and enables uh, ecosystem and climate uh, research, operational oceanography, which includes uh, ocean observation, modeling, prediction, marine technology, uh, and ultimately contributing to sustainable economic development as well as high quality of life with our coastal environments and our recreational and, and tourism activities. So these are some details about the building itself. It's uh, 64,000 square feet. It's a three-story building. Uh, includes, I'll, and I'll show you some, uh, some examples of this so I don't have to go through this in too much detail here. Uh, but a variety of different types of spaces. Uh, it's a lead silver building. This shows the campus in the south end of New Bedford. It's a, an architect's rendering. Uh, but this is the existing building here, the uh, 32,000 square feet, and then the new building, the uh, 64,000 square feet. So together, roughly about 100,000 square feet of, of a marine campus uh, with a pier uh, providing access to uh, seawater in the Clark's Cove. This is the uh, first floor concept uh, showing the uh, classroom areas here, which can be reconfigured. Uh, and again, I'll show you some pictures of these so you get an idea. This is a seawater laboratory. We have the labs here, faculty offices, and then student offices on the, in the outer areas, a, a public uh, area, lobby area here. So this is the commons area just outside of that classroom meeting room area. Uh, very popular with students for getting together for informal discussions, lunch, so on. This is the meeting room area, which can be reconfigured in different ways, either as one large room, similar to what we have here. You can break it up into separate classrooms or conference rooms. It's already been very busy. Uh, we, we moved into the building in September. I think we've had seven or eight conferences there already, except for workshops. This is the uh, faculty uh, research area and, and interaction space. And this is a rendering of uh, one of the research labs, the wet research labs. And as you can see, the way they're configured, they can be rearranged to meet different needs as uh, needs change over time. It's one of the things we, we wanted to make sure since 10, 20 years from now, it's not necessarily a sure thing what kind of work we're going to be doing. We expect some of the things will continue, but there will be new work as well, and we want to be able to adapt these laboratory spaces to meet those needs. An engineering lab. This is a little hard to see, but this is the uh, computing center. Uh, this, this center has the capability for 510 racks uh, of computing.
computers. It's, it's already almost full, and, but it supports some of the uh, ocean modeling work that's going on. And then the seawater laboratory. Uh, this, this is a uh, much larger, we, we had a smaller uh, lab similar to this uh, in our, our other building. Uh, this is about three times the size has capability for multiple different types of seawater treatments, uh, five different treatments of either filtered or unfiltered, temperature controlled. We can simulate tropical environments, temperate environments. It has a redundant uh, seawater treatment system, so it uh, gives us the, the capability if one part of that goes down, we can service that while uh, maintaining the, uh, the operations and the integrity of any experiments that are going on. And then our our other building will continue to be used and continue to be functional. It's, it's undergoing renovations. Uh, but one of the uh, capabilities of that that may be of interest to this group is that we have a 90,000 gallon, uh, 21 feet deep optic and acoustic test tank, uh, which is really designed for uh, both uh, academic work as well as research uh, and outside users, uh, you know, pri private users. Uh, it's available to, to be scheduled. Uh, the tank is built specifically for acoustic work so that it uh, has, uh, it's isolated, acoustically isolated from the building noise and also uh, designed to minimize any kind of uh, uh, reflection, sound reflection within that space. So that's our facilities. I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, our, uh, our research and academic areas and I'm, I'm going to try to go quickly here because I know um, we're getting far along here in the, the time, but I, I just want to kind of highlight the areas that we're involved in, and some of these have already been mentioned, ecosystems and climate, fishery, science and management, ocean observing and modeling, ocean biogeochemistry, and then physics and engineering. And I want to, to illustrate this, I'm going to just pick a subset of some of the researchers uh, that are doing work at, uh, at SMAS, and certainly, again, this is not a complete or exhaustive list, but it hopefully gives you some flavor of, of some of the work that's going on. And the other thing I'll point out is that while some of this work is very dependent on technology and on autonomous platforms, for example, uh, Wendell Brown's work, uh, other work relies on sort of more traditional just getting out there, collecting water, uh, making measurements, and so we're not going to get away from that, but I think what, what we want to be able to do is start to see how technology and our more traditional methods of research can come together uh, and really uh, benefit each other and sort of enhance our capability. And, and so a first example of that is some work that uh, Kevin Stokesbury and his lab uh, is doing, our research faculty, Dave Bethany, on uh, video techniques for monitoring fisheries. And in this case, it's the scallops the scallop resource, which uh, is one of the most profitable uh, uh, species, uh, fishery species in New England. Uh, New Bedford has consistently been the highest valued port, fishing port in, in landings, and value of landings over the past 10 plus years, uh, and that's largely due to the scallop resource. Uh, and, and Kevin's group, working with a variety of other researchers and, and fisheries management uh, organizations, NOAA and others, develop this capability, uh, this camera system tripod, which basically allows the ability to lower this down and, and actually uh, image the scallop, uh, scallops on the bottom, and then ultimately count those. And so here's an example of a map that uh, from 2015 just showing one of the surveys that was done. Each one of these black dots represents one drop of the camera, or actually four drops at each of those points, and then uh, an average of that. Uh, and then the red circles represent the uh, number of scallops that were actually uh, present at that station. So it provides a very comprehensive map of the resource. And, and Kevin and his group have worked very closely with the industry then to coordinate this, use this information to say, where do we need to uh, uh, focus our efforts, and where do we want to back off and allow the resource to, uh, to grow and, and mature. Uh, and, and so part, this was really part of, an integral part of the 
uh, adaptation by NOAA fisheries management to a rotational management scheme, which is much like farming if you think about how we rotate crops uh, in, in agricultural, land-based agriculture. Uh, this is a similar principle here, is that they rotate where they allow the fishing. Um, what that does is it allows those uh, juvenile scallops to mature in areas where uh, they're closed to fishing. To give you an idea of the success of this, here's, here's the scallop resource in the late 90s. This is what a, a hull looked like, a uh, scallop uh, hull looked like in the late 90s. And then as this rotational management strategy started to come into play, you see already uh, major recovery by the early 2000s, and then more recently, this is the kind of haul that uh, can be expected in many, many situations. So a very successful uh, and sustainable management strategy. On, on a different or flip side story, we have cod, New England cod, unfortunately, uh, which has seen sort of the opposite trend, a, a dramatic drop uh, in, in the 90s and, uh, and has continued to be uh, very low and, and so uh, tremendous amount of restrictions uh, on that fishery. Uh, and those restrictions, not only do they restrict the amount of uh, cod that can be harvested by fishermen, but they also restrict the ability to uh, meet quotas of other types of fish because uh, the fishermen are limited by how many cod they can catch. So even if they're trying not to catch cod and they catch it, they still are required to, to uh, abide by those quotas and, and have to hold off the amount that they fish. So Kevin's approach to this has been to try to better understand both the, get, get a better handle on the actual abundance of cod, but also the distribution so that we can help the fishery avoid areas where cod are spawning, where they might be uh, you know, critical habitat that will allow them to recover. And so he's developed this system which basically takes a traditional fishing net, puts a um, uh, sort of a, a tank with the bottom cut out of it in there to maintain an opening, and then mounts cameras inside that uh, that allows him to see uh, fish as they're entering the net. So hopefully this will work. So here's an example of the type of imagery you get and the variety of fish in this particular example. And so, you know, you, you look at that and say, well, that's cool, that's a great picture. But how do we quantify that? How can we now take this and actually start to quantify? And so, working with a company that uh, came out of MIT, Sea Vision, and with a, a group that uh, has been helping with the electronics, Electromechanica, he's come up with this approach, which now is an open source software approach which actually tracks individual fish as they're entering the net. Uh, and you have to track them because sometimes they actually swim back out and so you can't count them if they do that, right? They are fish after all. And, uh, and you can see it's also actually identifying flat versus round fish. So this is, a, this is an intelligent algorithm. It's an open source algorithm. It's basically using a machine learning approach to train itself uh, and getting to a point now where this could become an operational technique for counting cod. This, uh, and I, I just want to mention before I talk about this, uh, Kevin's also now working with some of the offshore wind developers in uh, agreements to start to look at how offshore wind may affect fisheries as well. And so the kinds of approaches that he's using are going to be very important for for that effort as well, to try to understand and monitor the effects of offshore wind infrastructure on fisheries, on habitat, and so on. And I'm happy to talk more about that if anybody's interested. So I'm going to pick up the pace even faster. I know I'm, I'm going on and on here, but uh, so I want to mention Changshing Chen's work on the Northeast Coastal Ocean Forecasting System. He's using a, a computer model called a Finite Volume Community Ocean Model which is an unstructured grid physical model, and you can see the, the variety of information. So again, ocean observation, that information, the model is just a model. You need to be able to initialize that, you need to validate that. Uh, it can't run in a vacuum and, and be trusted. So uh, it depends on a lot of input from other uh, sources, and it's also 
run at different scales, at different resolutions. So there's a global model, a regional model, and then a Massachusetts coastal model that increase and go increasingly more higher resolution as you go along. This is just an example of uh, the spatial grid. This is the Cape Cod area. You can see it's sort of this uh, triangular grid, and as you get closer to uh, the coastal area, the resolution gets much much finer, so this is the Buzzards Bay area expanded here, just to give you an idea. And here's a, a, a current vector map showing this is Woods Hole here and the tidal currents coming in through uh, Woods Hole. If anybody's ever sailed through there, you know that can get pretty hairy sometimes, and, uh, but it's also a pretty cool place to, to sail through if you ever have an opportunity. Uh, here's some of the examples of the coastal work that he's doing. Uh, we see um, all these different locations here along the Massachusetts coast. And just to give you a couple more examples, this is uh, the Massachusetts Bay and Boston Harbor where he's doing work. Uh, and what this gives you, here's situate mass, is the ability to start to do forecasting of storm surge inundation. Now this is just showing uh, the tidal cycle in situate mass. Uh, so you get an idea of the detail. I'm not actually showing a storm <coughs> scenario here. But you can really see the level of spatial resolution that you, now you're getting down to almost the level of individual buildings and structures. And that's the type of product that's going to be needed to be able to forecast in a way that will allow us to really um, understand and, and manage and uh, provide appropriate response, emergency response, in situations where storms are impending. And then this is uh, just an example of some work that Wendell Brown's group is doing. Uh, Wendell has been working with Rutgers University uh, and others, uh, Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences, on deploying gliders in sort of a networked fashion, multiple gliders being deployed. They call it the glider palooza. And they've done this now several years in a row where they de the simultaneously deploy multiple gliders from different sites. And their goal is really to understand this cold pool feature. This is a feature of cold water uh, that is trapped underneath uh, the warming layer in the summer. And it's very important for fisheries recruitment. It's also important for understanding heat exchange dynamics in our, our region. Uh, and so trying to, to map that, satellites can give you a picture of the surface, but they can't see uh, down below depth. And so you really need that combination of, of sort of a three-dimensional view. This is a recent deployment that uh, his group did. Um, in uh, September, August, September of, of this year. And it shows uh, this transect here going from Martha's Vineyard. Uh, and uh, you can see here this cold pool, uh, the warm surface layer here. And I didn't, I didn't show it, but I, I, gotta, I gotta show you this video just for fun. This is the actual deployment. just like that, and off it goes. And I believe there's one of those out, sitting right out here in the hallway, so I'll leave, I'll leave the, the experts to tell you how it works, but, uh, but it's a pretty cool system. So um, lastly, uh, Brian Howell's work on Massachusetts Estuaries Project. This is really uh, just hard work getting out there uh, in your mud boots and sweat and you're, you're taking small boats out and you're collecting water, you're collecting water quality information, nutrients, plankton, uh, sediments, uh, but how do we now take that information and make it useful? What Brian's group has done is worked with an engineering firm that developed a, a water quality model and, and watershed model that plugs in all that data and actually develops then a a comprehensive strategy of nutrient plan that, that uh, is then able to be used by municipalities to help their nutrient management uh, efforts and either 
you know, upgrade septic systems or go to switch to a sewage if that's what's needed. Uh, but it's been a very uh, valuable collaboration between communities, between the State Department of Environmental Protection, uh, and between SMAS faculty and students. So I'm going to finish up with just a couple more slides here. Uh, what are the opportunities for a regional network on maritime innovation? The, the need for an innovation network is clear, uh, and this was documented in that, uh, that maritime economy report the public policy, uh, the public policy center presented. We, we need to strengthen connections within the marine technology cluster. We have tremendous breadth and expertise and, and experience, but how do we make that um, a more cohesive uh, entity, something that, that really has the ability to uh, advocate for this effort as a whole? Um, and federal funding, for example, we saw in some, I think it was Jim Billingham's work where he showed the distribution of federal funding is going down while industry investment's going up. We, that federal funding has to continue because it, there are certain things that have to be funded through uh, federal or, or state grants, but that has to be then coupled with partnerships, private and public partnerships and other strategies to, to invest. Uh, and we need to find technologies for, um, or, or capability to enable commercialization and, and tech transfer. Uh, and then create a more stable and, and predictable business environment that, uh, where regulatory uh, conditions are clearer and, and more, uh, more readily uh, addressed. So we have a critical mass of, of private and public and government, non-governmental ent entities in the southern New England area and linkages to other uh, groups beyond that. Um, so we really have this, this capability, this sort of emerging opportunity that um, we, we can uh, take advantage of. And so that, that really brings me back to this concept of the UMass Blue Economy Initiative. Uh, South Coast Massachusetts is a microcosm of economic challenges and opportunities, uh, and it can offer lessons to understand and develop this blue economy and new innovations. Uh, and so that really is the, the uh, sort of uh, interest and, and uh, priority of our chancellor, our, our new chancellor, Chancellor Johnson, is to bring together business, government, labor, academia, and so on, and examine these innovations and ventures in the maritime arena. So uh, with that, I'm going to conclude and just, again, hope that uh, we can continue to, to look at how we can work together, collaborate, innovate, and, and look to our future for a brighter future. Thank you.